We are live. Are we? We are. And I'm going to give you the output there. Have okay. The output. It doesn't matter. I don't, I don't look at it. <laughs> Hello, it's, lovely uh, humans. Hello. It's distracting. All right. That's fine. Yeah. I actually encourage people because I, because my output, like when I'm interviewing somebody, I'm outputting essentially the structure of the show. Yeah. And it's very confusing because oftentimes they're having to look at themselves in the camera or in the screen. Like, cause normally when you use like video software, you're looking at the person that you're talking to. Mm -hmm. But when a person is getting interviewed by me, they're looking at what the show is looking like to the audience. And so, yeah. What, what is this? There's a bunch of weird, short things for astronomy cast. They're not live on our channel. Do you know what those are? No. There's some like video okay. version that maybe Ali's recording on the to be then be, to be shared out to something. Anyway, don't worry about it. Our YouTube channel. Yeah, it's on our YouTube channel. There's like, if you go to the content, there's a, there's one for every episode, and they're they seem like they're about the length of an episode. So that's, I I think I figured this out. I've talked my way through, what I think it is. Okay, yeah. I bet those are the raw recordings, and then the edited ones get put live. I think it's the other way around. Because I don't think because I don't think we we put a live version of, of the show like. We don't we don't put an edited version of the show on YouTube. We just stick with the live show. Okay. Right. I don't know. Yeah. I thought we had an edited version. I'm gonna have we to do. clearly I, check with humans. I, I think the edited version is the one that is that is unlisted and is used for say sending to the TV channel and things like that. Okay. Yeah, there Beth is saying they're edited versions of the show. There you go. So, why? so I, I've found my way to the right answer, right? Beth? Why, why don't we put the edited versions live? Because then you'd have double the, you'd have two episodes, two versions of every episode. And you don't want to lose the live show because that's got all this nonsense that we start with. And the chat at the end where we answer questions and such. All right. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like this is the original source. This is the, this is the best this is for the completest, but I can totally understand. I mean, I don't want to, we should not start up multiple channels, No. but I can totally not. understand people wanting a, a shorter version of just the episode, please. That's the podcast. That is the podcast, but do they want a video version of it? I don't know. They don't. They just listen to it. What kind of monster watches a video anyway? Right? We all listen to podcasts. There you go. Beth Johnson is saying the edited versions are for new media. Yeah, for the new media, not this old media that we use. All right. Uh, I I I am simply going to to Just go along for the ride. Just Yeah, that's it. I am along worry about for it. the ride. Don't... <laughs> I, I'm here to know the science and apparently yeah. to know nothing else at this point in a Monday. The decision yeah. to cut back on caffeine may have been a mistake. What? <sighs> Are you under caffeinated? I might be. This is a disaster. Look, like, stop this right now. Go p pound Red Bulls, maybe? I'm not no. sure. Oh, oh, God, that would, like, horrify my heart. No, no, it's... Yeah. All right, we're gonna we're gonna bully through. We're gonna bully through. Yeah. Whoa. Pool like, Tuka saying video is nice, but I'm a deaf person, so you know biases. Pool, how do you watch the live show being hearing impaired? Does YouTube's automatic translation, automatic captions work well enough? That's tell us more. Yeah, tell us how that works. That's fascinating. Um, yeah, no, I'm Ian Farquhar saying I don't listen to podcasts only when I have no cho no choice. That's crazy. I my house would never be clean. Like the only yeah, way either yeah. exercise or cleaning gets done 
is yeah. I'm listening to podcasts or audiobooks. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I go on walks and I put on a podcast. Uh, I very rarely watch videos. And if I if like I find a video on YouTube, I try to figure out a way to turn it into a podcast if I can. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Pultuk is saying James Webb is super close, like 99% according to where is James Webb website. Yeah, uh, it should arrive at L2 today. Yeah. Oh, just the, the, the silence from Pamela. It's okay. It's all right. Until we'll get there. Until it demonstrates I know, I know. it works. Five months. Five months. We just got to wait five months and then we're all right. Okay. Let's get started. All right. So I need to open my audio software, mm -hmm. which it turns out I hallucinated opening. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm helping some folks out with a conference that's timed for Europe. And mm -hmm. so I, I made the mistake of doing this the same time I realized I need to cut back on caffeine. So I have been up since 6.30 a.m. And... Wow. Yeah. And Do you I want to hear had... something super sad? Yeah. I have no, I don't drink coffee right you now. You were born this way, weren't you? No, 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 no. I just don't drink coffee right now because we don't really have the room and the facility for you to make good coffee here in the trailer. <laughs> and so like my espresso machine is sitting in the sea container waiting. And so I've been drinking tea and Carla is a giant yeah. tea fan. And I, and so, and she's been bringing me into the modern art of tea. And so yeah. she orders these, she doesn't like black teas. I pretty much prefer black tea. She likes green teas and, and oolong poor. Yeah. These weird uh, uh, teas and yeah. they're good. And so I, but, and she bought me this great little tea mug that's, sort of lets you steep the tea inside of it and then it's got like a little filter inside so you just put the loose leaf tea into it mm -hmm. and then you steep it and then you drink it out and pull it out and you drink it and it's great and all but i really miss coffee yeah yeah i <laughs> so, i'm currently drinking jasmine tea which is no caffeine and i love jasmine tea but yeah. um yeah yeah so i so i when we like this was a great experiment for me to switch off coffee and just drink tea for the last six months but i am definitely going back to coffee sorry carla <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah she uh i mean this, the tea's so compact and it, it, you know but but i uh you know every week when i go out and get some supplies i stop at the coffee shop and get a coffee and i'm like oh yeah coffee i remember you <laughs> Well, so, and hot water kettles are a lot more versatile than mm -hmm. coffee makers, unless you're doing pour over, in which case you use the same hot water kettle. But yep. pour over in a really cold room is a very bad idea. Why? Because the the pour over system, it it's... As you pour, the water's cooling. As it's going through the coffee, it's cooling. As it hits your cup, it's cooling. Whereas at least the whole where it's percolating part is warm in the coffee maker. Yep. So, yeah. Uh, okay. Let us, uh, let us proceed. Okay. Come when you're ready. I am pressing record. I have pressed record. I have also pressed record. Here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 628, The Sun Revisited. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I I am doing well enough. Uh, I am currently trying to cut back on caffeine, and uh, wow, this is going to be yeah. a caffeine light episode. Everyone, you are warned. We need to warn everybody that you are dangerously under caffeinated today. It is and true that that could have serious consequences. <laughs> so, uh, just just if 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 it seems like I'm sort of having to sort of boost her awake again every now and then 
it's 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 not uh you know it's fine it's fine she'll get over this it's it's uh, true <laughs> yeah you, you i think like you have always just had so much coffee flowing in your system mm, I'm, yeah yeah, I, I'm definitely one of those people that when the doctor asks, how much coffee do you drink? If I say two, it means pots, not cups. <laughs> and and oh. I, I'd yeah. gotten better for a while so that I was down to like 60 ounces of coffee a day. 60, and, yeah, it's like 60 fluid ounces. Yeah, yeah. Which, yeah, yeah. Is a lot. So I drink about a third of that. Yeah. Like I, I drink two cups of coffee a day. So that's Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, so I was only having three cups, but they were 20 ounce cups. Yeah. So so I, I realized over Christmas that because I was so acclimated, I had to go up to five 20 ounce cups a day to have it really take an effect, at which point the anxiety kicks in. Yeah, yeah. And in the modern telling. world we live in, no one needs added anxiety. So I am, no. I'm back to twenty ounces of coffee a day. Wow. And regretting all my life choices. Yeah, that's not them. enough. That's not enough. Like this is this is madness. But anyway, we'll we'll see how we'll see how you do. Uh, all right. So once again, it's time to take a look at the sun. You know that ongoing thermonuclear explosion of fusing hydrogen that's right over there. Fortunately, there's a fleet of spacecraft and ground observatories ready to give us our best ever view of the sun so we can watch it. Always watching. And we're going to talk about it. But first, it's time for a break. And we're back. All right, Pamela, the sun. Uh, again, we covered this on our tour of the solar system a thousand episodes ago. Almost, actually. That, that, <laughs> you know, we're in the 600s, and I say a thousand episodes ago. Actually, you know, we're within uh, order of magnitude. Error balls. Yeah, error, but error bars are starting to come in line here. Uh, when I when my hyperbole lines up with reality, we know there's a problem. Um, what? And so we're going to stick to the new-ish stuff. Obviously, we know the sun ball of hydrogen helium fusing in core releasing energy radiated pressure different layers inside really hot inside less hot on the surface it's going to last for a while and then it's going to die okay now what's new about the sun <laughs> it, it's really interesting so it's so the thing that got me the most prepping for today's episode is when we first started this show and first did that tour through the solar system Everyone was like, okay, so so for decades, we thought there was a solar neutrino problem and we think we might have figured it out. We think maybe the neutrinos are changing flavors and this could explain it. And nowadays they don't even mention the solar neutrino problem because yeah. It's not a problem. Neutrinos have identity crises on a regular basis and just oscillate their variety to whatever suits them at the moment so the sun is giving off all the neutrinos it is supposed to and then many of those neutrinos are deciding to become a different kind of an electron of a right. neutrino and um yeah right, so, so yeah so we're just going to call this now the solar neutrino thing the solar neutrino reality anyway all right yeah. so how are What's our, I mean, we've done whole shows on neutrinos, but yes. give us just sort of a quick version of what a neutrino is. A neutrino is a basic particle that can't be broken down any further. And um, they generally carry the bits of stuff that have to be conserved in a reaction. So... Right. If, if you have a reaction involving an electron, it will often give off a anti-electron neutrino just to make sure that all the bits and pieces of like the, the reaction. Like rounding years. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. And so in the core of the sun where nuclear reactions are going on, where hydrogen is getting transformed into helium, neutrinos that should be electron neutrinos are getting created. And for the longest time we were only detecting and we continue to only detect a fraction of the number of expected neutrinos and 
if a particle is made up of no mass, it can travel at the speed of light and its identity is pretty well locked in. So think photon. Mm. And for decades, it was thought that neutrinos maybe had no mass, were traveling at the speed of light. And then it was realized some neutrinos appear to have mass. Shoot, all neutrinos appear to have mass. And that means they're able to swap around what ratio of their identity is tied up into energy versus mass. And that electron neutrino can now become a tau neutrino, a muon neutrino. And those are detected in different mechanisms. So we weren't seeing them in the original data sets. And now we realize, okay, neutrinos are weird. And... um, the neutrino and, and, solar neutrino problem is not a problem and so we knew that neutrinos were being the, the math said a certain amount of neutrinos mm-hmm. should be getting thrown out from the sun yes but we were only detecting a very precise fraction of those neutrinos because yes. our detecting equipment only allowed us to see one kind of new one flavor of neutrino which is the only it, flavor that originally leaves the sun they just change on their way here right and so they're all leaving the sun in this one flavor. They're changing into different flavors and then they're passing through the earth. And we finally have the capability to detect the other flavors. Yes. So weird, but so cool. <laughs> I want to just rabbit hole for one second. Okay. Just that, that for people who have this, like all the time, and I'm sure you get this too, people have this instinctual, I don't like dark matter. It seems made up. What's this nonsense that astronomers are trying to figure out? But right. but neutrinos, the, the the search and discovery oh, yeah. of neutrinos are such a beautiful analogy for dark matter that that you've got um, this this theoretical particle that should uh-huh. be there, but astronomers were not able to detect it. That uh, that didn't interact with regular matter in any way. Mm-hmm. We know that neutrinos can go through a light year worth of lead and not interact. That they're out there and are responsible for some of the processes that we know, but yet astronomers are able, not able to detect them. And so they had to develop multiple different capture mechanisms to finally figure out a way to detect them. And, and, and it's, it's they were not... Dark matter. And then they, and now they're a known particle. And and the thing is, it's not even so much a capture mechanism. You you can't lay a trap out for a neutrino and 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 put food in the center, and you'll end up with a neutrino in your cage. Yeah. We we have to actually hope that in vast vats of liquid, a neutrino will just happen to collide with something just right that it triggers a flash of light and so it's it's no clear cut and dried it's a well this happens to match this exactly yeah and so you have countless and i forget the number now countless neutrinos passing through your body from the sun Mm -hmm. right now Mm -hmm. and almost none of them are interacting with the particles in your body. And yet, again, and yet we know experimentally in with incredible precision that these things are there, that that there are particles fully able to to do this and no one freaks out about or no one dismisses the idea that neutrinos exist. It's accepted physics. And dark matter is the same thing just 10 years back, 20 years back on the discovery experiment pipeline and we'll get there. So it's, uh, yeah, it's funny to me, like, like when people have that conversation and I'm just like, well, how do you feel about neutrinos? And they're like, well, what about them? I'm like, you got this particle that passing through interact, doesn't interact with regular matter. Is that okay? Are you okay with that particle? Anyway, let's move on. Uh, cause I could, uh, just certain feel like a soapbox. I, I, I want to put just a little bit of numbers to that. So the yeah. sun is is fusing 600 million tons of hydrogen per second. Each one of the reactions involved in all the atoms that add up to that 6 million tons is, is producing a neutrino as part of the reaction. Right. 
and and that is admittedly getting spread out over a sphere but that's all nonetheless getting blasted out from the sun every second yeah and again they're rounding errors they are a tiny amount of matter compared to the mass of the sun the mass of the of the the atoms in the sun and yet we can detect them yes and they were predicted and then they were detected and that's how science works all right uh we're gonna talk about more about the sun in a second but it's time for another break hold on do not stop okay so apparently my microphone is is being loud attached yeah to where i put it so i'm gonna switch my it's not that it's system. loud it's occasionally my hair was getting it causing some kind of blast yep okay this should work better sorry about that humans right. out there okay. okay we should be better now and we're back but since we did that sh episode of the show, whatever, 15 years ago, there <laughs> yes. have been a fleet of spacecraft launched and a new incredible ground observatory designed to help us understand the sun better. The most famous of which, of course, is probably the Parker Solar Probe. So can we talk just a bit about what that spacecraft is going to be doing? So, so the Parker Solar Probe, as we are recording this on January 24th, 2022, it's getting ready to start its next perihelion run into the sun where it's expected that today it's going to rotate to have its heat shield into the sun so that you can go and check out what temperature it's at at the website. And, and what it's doing is orbit after orbit, it's getting itself a little bit closer and a little bit closer so that we're able to actually acquire data from within the sun's corona and yeah. this this is that part of the sun that is enigmatically hot for well pick which reason you believe the most so like like that part is amazing the yeah parker solar probe is passing through the mm -hmm. atmosphere of the sun yes and you can see that like like when you watch an eclipse and you're not completely clouded out like what we experienced that that hazy glow around the sun is the corona yes parker solar probe is passing into that region it's that close and and this region of the sun the energy in the individual particles has a temperature of two to five million degrees now the catch is that there are very very few particles Right. So it's not totally going to destroy our poor innocent spacecraft. Uh, but every few years, it has seemed like there was a new press release, usually coming out at an American Astronomical Society meeting, that said, we now understand why the transition zone is only 40,000 degrees and the chromosphere below it is 10 to 36,000 degrees. And then the corona at the very top is suddenly two to five million degrees. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's always been something to do with magnetic fields. And with Parker Solar Probe, they think they actually figured out exactly what the mechanism is. And, and here, if you have a better pronunciation than I am, please correct me. But from what I've been able to hear, the pronunciation is the Alfven waves. Mm, okay. And these are where you have magnetic fields going through plasma and the plasma gets distorted away from the magnetic field line and it oscillates as it comes back to the field line, releasing energy as it does. And it's thought that it's these Alvin waves that that are releasing the energy that is heating up the corona. And it's really bizarre. I mean, just the yeah. fact that, as you said, the surface of the sun is, say, just shy of 6,000 degrees. Mm -hmm. the, the upper atmosphere, or the lower atmosphere rises into the tens of thousands of degrees. And then you kick up into the millions of degrees. It's It's been the biggest unsolved mystery in solar astronomy. And now we're at the point where it's largely understood that you've got these weird resonant magnetic waves pulsing through the plasma 
of the sun, powered by the magnetism of the sun, releasing this energy in a way that that keeps these temperatures so high. And, Bizarre. And beyond just that, with Parker Solar Probe going in so close, they've been able to start to measure the transitions in how the spacecraft is interacting with the magnetic field that tells them they have gone from the point where the solar winds are, are free of the magnetic and gravitational pull of the sun and able to fly their, their happy way across the solar system to being inside that line and into an area where the gas is bound by magnetic fields and gravity. And we now know where this transition is. It's, it's out about 18 uh, solar radii out from the center of the sun. And we're also finding that there's quiet once the mission gets in there. And just this idea that if you go in far enough, things quiet back down. Uh, is often likened to passing within a storm. So that outer part is, is a storm, and as you get closer, it actually quiets. And this, and Parker Solar Probe is gonna be getting closer still. Yes, yes. And, and this is where we're looking at it getting down to less than 10 solar radii out, mm -hmm. and it's doing this slowly over the course of years. And sorry, I need to pull up the timeline on this. It was in my head and then I looked at something else. Sorry, editors, we adore you editors. Where is the timeline? Okay. With every orbit, it's getting a little bit closer, a little bit faster. It's, it's actually starting to get to the point as it gets, well, in 2025 to perihelion 24, we're still down at seven. It's, it's going to be hitting speeds where folks start talking about, well, it is a fraction of a percent of a speed of light, and it yeah. is not an embarrassingly bad percentage of the... Yeah, it's moving at relativistic speeds. Yes, that, that is kind of awesome. Yeah. And with, with each different passage, they're hoping to probe not just the sun uh, as a function of distance, but we're also experiencing a fairly significant portion of the solar cycle. We, we finally started making the, these perihelions uh, in 2018, and that was about solar minimum. Exactly when solar minimum was is something you find out after the fact. Yeah. Uh, we are now heading into the next solar maximum, should be sometime around 2025. It's unclear if it is going to be earlier than normal, or if it is going to be a higher number of sunspots than predicted, we just know at this moment in time, we're seeing more solar activity than was expected. And, and Parker Solar Probe is going to be there getting closer and closer as the sun gets more magnetically tied up and more magnetically tied up so that as the sun is hitting maximal chaos, Parker Solar Probe is also getting its tightest in orbits. That's going to be amazing. All right, we're going to talk about more missions to explore the sun in a second, but it's time for another break. And we're back. All right, let's talk about the Europe's companion to the Parker Solar Probe. I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, the solar orbiter, ESA's solar orbiter. The European Space Agency Solar Orbiter spacecraft. I apparently know nothing about this. One moment. We told you folks, I am under caffeinated and this was going to be a problem. Yeah. Beginning routine science operations, they started in November. I should You were you were hoping for the you were hoping that it hasn't recorded science yet, Claus. I was. I really, really <laughs> was. I mean, um, short answer, right? Solar orbiter 
is is it going to be there. increasing its inclination orbit by orbit to try and view this the sun the from going to do the higher poles. yeah to be able okay to be but also sort of farther away better photography of the sun okay. like yeah i i'm there now up. my my yeah. brain had combined things okay yeah and so the, okay. the whole point is with parker with solar orbiter and with daniel k anyway you've got these three perspectives of the sun yeah. continuously that will give us totally new way of thinking about the sun yes okay so with solar orbiter i uh, there's this interesting bifurcation of of plans that they originally had for a solar mission back in the 90s folks were thinking about planning a solar probe that would go into a beautiful orbit over the poles of the sun getting there via jupiter taking the long journey with lots of instrumentation and under NASA Administrator Sean O'Keefe, it and a whole lot of other programs got zeroed out. Mm. And that, that idea that we need to see the sun not just equatorially, which is easiest to do with the kind of orbit that uh, well, uses the Earth and Venus and Mercury, all those things for gravitational assists. For something like that, you want to stay in the plane of the disk. If you're just going to hop off Jupiter and dive straight in, you can come in over the pole. So we're getting the, the equatorial observing more with Parker Solar Probe and Solar Orbiter coming in on the European Space Agency side. It made its first encounter in November of 2021. It has that more polar orbit that's going to allow us to see the other parts of the magnetic field. And it's also there for, well, essentially solar maximum as it gets closer and closer in over time. And um, it's not getting as close no. as Parker. No. Nice and, healthy distance away. Yeah. And it's carrying a different suite of instruments. And, and this is where we have to remember that all of these different things um they have they have their own costs and so you can either spend a whole lot of money on a heat shield or a whole lot of money on your cameras and instrumentation and with solar orbiter they were going for the well the instrumentation they have a solar wind plasma analyzer a energetic particle detector they're doing all sorts of different remote sensing where they're looking in the ultraviolet, they're doing spectral imaging, they have their own chronograph. And, and with all these different instruments, um, they're gonna get as close as they can safely get and give us that polar perspective on what the sun is actively doing. Yeah, you've got like this, on the one hand, you're making your remote observations, but as you said, it's got instruments on board to detect the, the material flowing past it, the solar wind, the plasma, all of that. And so it's going to be both watching it from afar, but also swimming upstream through the solar wind and detecting it. But I love this idea of a spacecraft being able to finally look at the top of the sun. It's like a, it's a yeah. part of the sun that we've literally never seen. We have no idea. There could just be a big hole at the top of the sun and we've never seen it. And we will find there, there is get not a, a hole at the top of the sun. There could be a vortex. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Oh, that would be great. It would be yeah. amazing. Yeah, it could be um, just a big black circle at the top of the sun. We don't know. We don't know. I'm going to um, go with a no on that one. <laughs> fine. We, we suspect no, but we're about to have confirmed no. Um, <laughs> but, but, and it's great because now you have these two spacecraft that can, that can coordinate their observations of the sun and see an event from two different perspectives. But wait, there's more. Sure. So, so in addition to these two missions that have these spiraling inward orbits that are each taking their own route to get in, um, we also have the Solar Dynamic Orbiter, which is hanging out at the Lagrange point between the Earth and the sun. And, and there's also all of our ground-based systems and Soho. yeah so so you add in soho you add in the solar Day. dynamic orbiter 
all these other missions. There is literally a fleet out there and they each do their own special thing. And the thing about studying the sun is you really want to get as many different perspectives as possible because the sun it's it's oscillating on a variety of different scales. This is something that was first really measured by the gong system here on the surface of the planet. In in addition to having all of these oscillatory modes, its magnetic field is capable of bunching up in spots and creating the the sunspots that are so cool to see in solar projections and with proper filtering on a solar telescope. But the sun, as, as much as it's capable of doing these cool things, is also, create, is also uh, able to create great violence. There mm-hmm. was what was called the Carrington event in the 1800s, which oscillated the Earth's magnetic field so much that it generated electricity in telegram lines. Yeah, yeah. And so now yeah. with, the, with these instruments, all of these spacecraft and a ground-based observatory. We didn't even talk about the Daniel K. Inouye, which is like the biggest. It's like the the extremely large telescope for solar observing, which right. come online. You've got this ability to predict dangerous solar flare events with more notice than we've ever had. Like you can literally now start to see the sun preparing yeah. to release a flare in our direction, not just detecting it after the fact. Our, and, our understanding of the sun has just grown in leaps and bounds. And what I love is with Solar Dynamic Orbiter and SOHO, we have the full disk perspective and the full corona perspective. With, with the solar probe and the, so the Parker Solar Probe and ESA Solar Orbiter, we have the in situ, which is such a weird thing to say, observations of what's going on yeah. and then with the Daniel J. Awanwe pronunciation apologies telescope here on the surface of the earth we have the most zoomed in capacity that we have for anywhere yeah and and so it gives us that complete let's look at the whole thing and zoom in on what we care about this it's funny this episode I mean we didn't mention a few things that we've newly discovered but I think that the the, the take home is earth has amassed an enormous number of science instruments focus them at the sun and when we're ready to do another revision episode we will have a mountain of fascinating discoveries about the sun to share with you that we have learned all of the pieces are in place and now the sun will give up its secrets we just need to make it through solar maximum And it's the other side of the solar maximum that I think we're going to have some really cool information. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, Pamela. Thank you, Fraser. My brain is just like, I I no longer. Yes, I do have names. Wow. Okay. The lack of caffeine was a mistake. Sorry, editing team. Apologies. So as, as always, we are here thanks to the generous contributions of folks like you. Um, this week, I want to thank in particular Robert Wegner, Daniel Lossley, Randa Marco, Irasi, Alex Cohen, Jim Schooler, Philip Walker, Matthias Hayden, the lonely sand person, Justin Proctor, Paul L. Hayden, Gregory Singleton, Brian P. Cox, Tim McMacken, Jeff Wilson, Neil Bruce, Cooper, Stephen Shewater, Kenneth Ryan, Nate Detweiler, Benjamin Mueller, Gordon Turner, Aaron Zegrev, uh, Paul Disney, Alex Rain, Omar Del Riviero, Ninja Nick, Michael Regan, Matt Ruckner, Scott Briggs, Don Mundus, Karthik Vekatraman, Dean McDaniel, Jeremy Kerwin, Benjamin Kerr, Frodo Tenenbaugh, uh, Janelle Duncan, Moose and Deer, J. Alex Alexanderson, Father Prax, Bruce Amazine, Michelle Kalen, uh, Kimberly Rack, Antasor, Mark Stephen Raznak, Jim McGeehan, Mark H. Wydick, uh, Brent Nearnop, John Philip Grand, Dustin A. Roth, Smansky, Dwight Lilk, and Planetaire. And, Thanks, uh, 
Thank you so much. You make this possible. We'll see you next week. Stop the recording. And and I just want to say, I see over on Twitch, Mythtown, thank you so much for gifting subs to so many people. You are an amazing soul. People thank can subscribe. You so much. Oh, they're subscribing to CosmoQuest? Yeah, over okay. on Twitch. Six twenty-eight. Yes, I actually knew that this week. Okay. So this, so we're probably going to be recording on Mondays from here on out. Yeah. It it theoretically works better for Pamela's brain. <laughs> It was the combination of reduced caffeine and getting up at 6.30 a.m. Tomorrow I'm getting up at 5.30 a.m., so it could have been worse. Um, this should be much better. Um, yeah. I also went down a really bizarre rabbit hole for no good reason in prepping for this episode. Yeah. So the, the mission that they originally planned uh, that got killed by Sean O'Keefe was called Solar Probe. And they basically had to cancel it because it was way too big. And there was an entire outer solar system and sun observing program planned that was going to go to Europa. It was going to go to Pluto. Mm -hmm. And wow. he just canceled all of it. Yeah. And when they brought back the idea to do a much, much smaller, cheaper, not faster mission to the sun, they named it solar probe plus so the significantly tinier program was named solar probe plus right. smaller bigger name and then it became the first mission ever to be named after someone who was still alive and because it was a nonagenarian is that how you say that word mm -hmm. um there was, of course, the, the will he live to see it launch question, and he did. And I remember the day of the launch where, like, there were no interviews with him until it had successfully made it all the way off the planet of the Earth. The planet Earth. Off the planet of the Earth? Yes, that is what I said, isn't it? Um, and And so, I mean, can you just imagine, like, you write... A paper that changes everyone's perspective on the sun in the 1950s. And, and then you're in your 90s waiting to see if the mission actually makes it off the planet Earth. And yeah. like, that is way too much stress to put any 90-year-old under. And it was a smaller mission than the one originally called for. And yeah. yeah, so that was the rabbit hole I went down that was inappropriate. But nonetheless, where I went... Well, you never know what I'm going to ask. You never know what I'm going to want to I, talk about. It's true. That's the, it's that true. is, of course, the, the random nature of astronomy cast. <laughs> and, and sometimes we pay for that in in Pamela's unexplored rabbit holes. Solar flares, coronal mass unshared. ejections. I was prepared for all of that. Yeah. Um, but I do like that idea of us coming orbit. back and, and, and talking about the discoveries made by these missions. This collab, yes. this coordinated approach on the sun it's gonna be really exciting yeah um okay uh larry beckham says uh wait ulysses looked at the top end and bottom of the sun didn't it it did but uh, not with the same suite of instrumentation no yeah no pictures it, so therefore it didn't happen yes uh yeah it, it's just like it just like measured some something boring it doesn't count <laughs> whatever solar polar flow or what wow. yeah something like that um i can't that's weird huh my i can't access the okay all right all right um hal mckinney asks what are the main arguments for neutrinos not being dark matter 
Um, it, we just don't. So, so the currently known suite of neutrinos, electron, tau, and muon neutrinos, don't exist in sufficient numbers to on their own be dark matter. There is a concept called the sterile neutrino, which could account for dark matter depending on which theory of the sterile neutrino you go for, through. And I have to admit that is one of the theories I'm keeping an eye on because I have a small hope that it's actually going to go somewhere. Yeah. So the, so the biggest problem with the neutrino, and I, Hal, I'm sure we've talked about this before, is that that whatever dark matter is, it has to be cold. Yeah. And it has to be slow moving and cold. Like it just, like it just to, to match the observations for the amount of dark matter that we see and where it's located, it has to be cold. And we have and to get cold neutrinos somehow. Cold we just neutrinos. don't get yeah. those normally. And neutrinos are hot. The kinds of neutrinos that we know about are hot. They move fast, close to the speed of light. That's the key. Is that mm -hmm. you treat close to the speed of light, whatever dark matter is, it has to move slowly, yeah, relatively speaking. And as you said, Pamela, the sterile neutrino, like a big fat neutrino, Slum big fat, lumbering, slow, slow moving, moving. Yeah. yeah, slow moving neutrino could be the answer. So there's entirely a possibility that that a cold neutrino is the answer. But, yeah. but you can absolutely rule out the hot neutrino, the stuff streaming from the sun, the stuff left over from the Big Bang, all that stuff cannot be dark matter. It does and, not match the observations. And, and one of the questions coming in from Twitch is Sishu asks, uh, so could uh, dark matter be multiple particle types that include neutrinos? And yes, yeah. yes, Almost that's what my bet certainly. is. Yeah. 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 You're not the only one. Uh, a lot of the dark matter researchers that I talk to, I'm like, okay, place, you know, just between you and me, place your bets. And, 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 and they say it's a bunch of stuff. Yeah. And that's why it's going to be so annoying to understand. And, and the fact that all of these different standard model expansions that people keep coming out with, the, the super symmetry like models, we keep not finding any of the stuff that they predict. Yeah. So, so the question is, what part of the universe are we missing? And, and I love just, yeah. we need someone more creative to come along. And I love that. Yeah. The, um, oh man, I was going to mention something. I totally lost my train of thought. Never mind. Uh, let's move on. Um, Pultuk asks, how much longer for James Webb's first light from arrival today? I, I don't remember. A few months, I think. Five months. Yeah. So that, that counts as a few. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, where we're at right now, James Webb just as is going into insertion into its insertion orbit for mm -hmm. L2, like as we're recording the show or within a few hours after the show. It has released all of the clamps off of its mirrors and has tested moving the mirrors independently. Mm -hmm. But the big challenge that these mirrors have to be aligned down to about 10 nanometers of tolerance. And they're out and, by millimeters at the moment. Yeah, right now they're out by huge amounts, yeah. relatively speaking. And so it's, it's a, they, and they can only do one mirror at a time. And it's just this incredibly slow process, focusing on one mirror at a time, yeah. moving it a little bit and, and seeing how the light is coming in. And they're trying to just match up the light to get perfect focus. And it's going to take months, months. Yeah. And you can watch all of this happening online through their various tools um, that yeah. I find will simply make your heart like accelerate. I love it. I love all the, all the data, like the temperature of the of the cold side, the temperature of the hot side, the the distance, the all of this stuff. It's so great the 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 position of all of the mirrors. It's amazing. I I just, I, I just want to see it there. done. I I saw a tweet at one point before Christmas that was along the lines of all of the astronomers want 
to either, so there was two tweets. So one of them was all of the astronomers just want NASA to launch the telescope and not say anything until it works. And, and the other one was astronomers just want put in stasis until JWST has first light. And I'm like, yeah, either of those are completely valid solutions. Yeah. Like I, th it's funny when I think sort of like the psychology of us thinking about this mission, like it is the monster that ate astronomy budgets yeah. for 20 it years. It ate an entire generation of careers. Yeah. I mean, and so and many different researchers have gotten the phone call of because JWST cost overruns, <laughs> your budget is getting zeroed. I'm one of the ones. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's just, and, and, yeah. yeah. And yet... It's in space, working perfectly, arrived at its destination with plenty of fuel to spare, the most powerful science machine it ever built by humanity yet. that is just a few months away from starting to deliver us the goods. We hope. That we are, it's like we're approaching this astronomy singularity and we don't know what lies on the other side of James Webb. And if it's not awesome, we all are going to be really, really sad. Oh, yeah. No, like you don't even don't even say those words. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to work. Yeah. Like before I was like, it's going to launch. Now it's going to work. Yeah, I'm not there like, yet. Well, even if it doesn't perfectly align, they can still do science with it. Blurry, mediocre science. I don't want. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, yeah. Anything else? Let's see. So, um, how much can he does a follow up? If a neutrino does bump into something, wouldn't that make the neutrino cold? The problem is neutrinos don't bump it, into anything. Yeah, they 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 don't. <laughs> They're just like, hey, we refuse to interact. And they're they are yeah. the most introverted of particles out there. But that that idea, like when we think about like the bullet cluster and you can see that these oh, two I, yeah. enormous clouds of dark matter passed right through each other yeah. and, and didn't bump up and create a shock front in between the two of them. That is what two particle, that is what a particle that doesn't interact with anything looks like. And yeah, neutrinos yeah. are like that. It's just they don't match the observations. They cannot and, explain it. And we have now seen both galaxies that don't have dark matter and the interactions of systems that are just dark matter gravitationally with light. Yeah. So we know it's stuff. We can map where it is and isn't. We yeah. just don't know can't get, yeah. There's a great another great analogy as well, which was just the missing matter. Like we didn't know yeah. where half the baryonic matter was in the universe, and then cold gas, <laughs> right? And well, bits and pieces. Like they figured, yeah. oh, you know what? Parts of it are cold gas surrounding galaxies. Parts of it are are gas, hot gas in the interstellar intergalactic medium. Less of it is out. is stellar mass black holes that we can't see than we thought. Yeah, did you hear that number now? Like 40 quintillion black holes in the universe is the new number. That's which awesome. is only 1% of the baryonic matter in the universe. Like I said, less than we thought. And, and yeah. for a while, there was this cool idea in the early 2000s that a lot of the hidden mass was going to turn out to be... Ne neutron stars, brown dwarfs, black holes, hanging out there being dark and isolated and not getting noticed. And there was a lot of work done to try and find them with the Macho Project and the WIMP Project. And nope, <laughs> there's, yeah. there's, there's a lot of broke planets. But the scale of what's missing, it boils down to one like generic brick per solar system volume of space on average. So we're not looking for a lot. It's yeah. just yeah, I think enough it's, that it changes all the maths. 
so I think your math on that, I know you've been saying that for a couple of years, and mm -hmm. I think you're wrong. The It's the size of a small asteroid. Okay. It may have yeah. changed since yeah. I put that number in my head. Yeah. Okay. So it's, so it's not I'll a brick in a solar system. It's a, it's a small asteroid. Okay. Somewhere hidden in the entire solar system okay. is the amount of dark matter when you consider the volume of the space. Okay. So, um uh, Paul Disney asks, but if neutrinos don't bump into anything, how do we detect them? They occasionally will uh, bounce, interact with, jostle a, a molecule, and that will give off a flash of light that we can right. detect. And so, like, like if you take a, a, a thousand BB guns on one uh -huh. side and a thousand BB guns on the other side, and they both fire their BB guns in opposite directions. None of the BB guns are going to hit each None of the BBs are going to knock into each other and fall on the ground. The BBs are just going to pass through each other like this giant cloud. But if you take a fire hose on the one side and a fire hose on the other side and you fire them directly at each other, they're going to meet in the middle and the yeah. water is just going to crash down on the floor. And that's the difference that, yeah. that, Dark matter is like the BBs, while while Baryonic gas matter is, is gas is like the fire hose. Yeah. Yep. Um. I guess that's it. We reached the end. What? Okay. What's going on? What's happening? Um, I I am trying to convince my body it needs less caffeine. Um. Beyond that, I'm we're gonna have in the show side. Yeah, yeah. So Creative beyond projects. that, <laughs> so uh, we we have the daily space running Tuesday through Friday. We're switching over to a new uh, format for the show this week, where we're going to be allowing individual s stories to run longer when they need to. So uh, some episodes we will have fewer total stories, but more in depth stories than we were offering before. Um, so check it out, uh, Daily Space, wherever you get podcasts or over on YouTube and now media. Perfect. And I've got my live show today at 5 p.m., so in about five hours from now. Sounds good. Yeah, and more interviews coming. All right, well, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Thanks, Pamela, as always, for bringing the brain. Thanks to all of the moderators. Um, Nancy wasn't able to join us today, but yeah, but we're gonna have to figure that behind the out. Scenes. We're gonna have to figure that out. We, we will be shifting the recording time so Nancy Graziano can can be, can a part be of it. here. Yeah. So this yeah, is so, not the final time. No, no, there'll be another time change. Yeah. To whatever works best for for Nancy. That's yeah. how much we need her. And this is her. this is your this reminder. Is yeah. It takes. Nancy as chief cat herder, Beth, Allie, and Richard Drum all together to keep everything going behind the scenes. Yep. And all of our uh, moderators. Oh my goodness. Yeah, all of our moderators. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for everyone watching us on YouTube and on Twitch. And we will see all of you next week at some on Monday at some time. To be determined. To be, de to be determined. All right. Thanks, Pamela. <laughs> bye bye.